Nor did this movement have anything in common with my activity with art and the peace movement, where a dozen saints had demonstrated their goodness in the midst of an evil world. The student movement was no longer an enlightened minority. It was a substantial section of the student population. Opposition to the war had led students to begin opposing all the institutions that stood behind the war, including the university itself. What attracted me was not the university itself, nor the possibility it offered for rising in the academic hierarchy, but rather the opposition to the institution. I hadn't found anything that was so significant to me since the day when I had tried to find Hugh's project house. I wanted to be part of it, but in my own characteristic way. As always, I wanted to walk into a ready-made radical community. I wanted to submit myself to the tasks at hand instead of defining and creating them myself. As always, I looked for a guide, and I found one, though not among my fellow students. Professor Damon Hesper became not only my teacher, but also something like my tour guide to the student movement. The first day I attended his class, he was completely distracted by my presence. He avoided looking at me, as if he were afraid of me. I stayed after the class. We shook hands stiffly. He smiled dryly. I suppose you've come to judge me, he said. I've become a lackey of the ruling class and all that. He almost apologized to me. The professor, the highest university authority, had an inferiority complex in front of me. I beamed when I told him, I'm your student, Damon. I'm enrolled in your course. He couldn't believe it and looked at his list of students to confirm the fact. Well, I'll be damned, he said. The last time I saw you was when I was chased out of the garage at gunpoint. Alec told me you had moved in with your mother but had then disappeared again. I assumed you had rejoined your friends. We didn't say much more than that to each other during the entire semester. Damon was very rigid about not mixing his categories. The student-teacher relationship excluded the possibility of companionship. His course was an absolute bore. My curiosity about that died the second day I attended his class. Damon without Minnie was the same as Damon with Minnie. He still repeated the same slogans with the same emphasis and the same tone. His reading list consisted of standard academic books, which had nothing at all to do with his lectures, and he made no effort to relate the books to his comments. He didn't treat me as a former friend until the last day of classes, when I technically became a college graduate. He told me some students were organizing a teach-in about the war and invited me to attend with him. I was enchanted. I hadn't done anything political since the peace demonstration. After that day, during my year in graduate school, I attended student actions with Damon at least once a week, always as a passive observer. Damon was curious, but hostile. He told me he had spent some time working in a factory since I had last seen him, and he continually repeated his favorite refrain, the real organization wasn't going to be organized by students, but by industrial workers. I even listened to him lecture on this subject twice, when he was invited to speak at his student teach-ins. Both times he was introduced as factory worker Damon Hesper. From the scraps of conversations I had with Damon before and after student meetings during my year in graduate school, I pieced together enough of his life to figure out how the factory worker had become a university professor. Damon had been the only one of the admissions group who had enrolled in graduate school as soon as he finished his undergraduate study. After Alec visited me in the garage for the first time, he told Hugh, Damon, and Minnie that I had turned my back on the academic bureaucracy and joined the working class. According to Damon, this was what influenced Hugh to quit his studies and throw himself into an altogether different activity. Alec joined the garage group, Minnie got a job teaching in a high school, and both called Damon a hypocrite for enrolling in graduate school. That was when he and Minnie broke up, although Damon continued to attend the meetings of Minnie's organization. When Damon told me about this episode, he said, As soon as I realized that your activity in the garage had nothing to do with the revolutionary potentiality of the working class, and by trying to imitate you, Hugh and Alec only got themselves in a bind, I understood that the revolution was going to be made at the point of production, not in marginal, semi-criminal gang activities. So he went on to get the doctor's degree in philosophy, but he didn't start teaching right away. He got a job in a factory and continued to attend the organization's meetings. He even took a worker or two to some of the meetings. While he had the factory job, he convinced himself that Minnie's commitment had never been to a real worker's organization, but only to an organization of intellectuals completely separate from the working class. That realization brought on his final break with Minnie, as well as her organization. He told me that in the factory, he started to make contact with the class, particularly with one worker, apparently a worker who seemed to show interest for Damon's worker's newspaper. Suddenly, Damon's factory career ended, he told me. That worker turned out to be a cop or an informer because one day I was fired without explanation, and the only thing I had done that was in any way out of the ordinary had been to engage in political exchanges with this worker. 
Luckily, there happened to be an opening in the philosophy department at the university, specifically in his specialty, political philosophy. The first signs of student dissatisfaction were just appearing, and the administrators were looking for a person with Damon's qualifications. They were looking for a revolutionary factory worker with a doctor's degree in philosophy. I saw through Damon, but my own situation didn't give me an ideal vantage point from which to criticize him. My own drift back to academia also didn't give me a very solid basis from which to criticize Minnie's acceptance of her new profession. Minnie had reconciled herself to the status quo when she had joined the omission staff, but so had I. Although I had refused to write for that paper, I had taken part in its production as well as its distribution. Once her anger had passed, Minnie had thrown herself into it wholeheartedly. I had merely let it happen to me. And that was exactly what I did at the trial that took place last week. I ran out on my young comrades the same way I'd run out on Rhea, the same way I'd run out on you twenty years ago. I ran last week the same way I'd always run, passively, without conviction, without reasons or rationalizations. I had let Damon and Minnie take me to the admissions meetings. I had let Louisa take me on a trip across the ocean, away from those I regarded as my only friends. And I let Minnie take me out of jail. I didn't contribute to her defense strategy, but I didn't resist it. I simply let it happen to me. I moved where others pulled me. My whole life has been like that trial. It's been something that merely happened to me. Even when I found the communities I was looking for, I was taken there by others, and when I got there, I was shown what to do and how to proceed. Minnie's defense strategy was ingeniously simple. It wasn't based on fact, but on plausibility. She confronted one authority, the judge, with another, the professor. The professor said I was in fact his research assistant and had in fact been doing field research on the student movement. I was the only one who could deny it, and my denial would have been extremely embarrassing to both Damon and Minnie. I liked Minnie much better when I realized she was risking her reputation on my behavior. Damon as well as Minnie knew perfectly well that reliability and predictability were not among my most prominent qualities. Damon took the stand and described the research. The judge frowned but didn't express his views of left-wing professors. Hiring or firing such professors wasn't within his field of jurisdiction. I took the stand and nodded. When the judge asked me to speak louder, I shouted, Yes, I am. Yes, I did. It was the easiest thing in the world to lie to the state. And by lying, I ran out on my comrades. Many had told me they had already run out of me. I didn't know their names. I wasn't able to find out what happened to them. Just as 20 years ago, I hadn't been able to find out what happened to you. I took Minnie's word. I also told myself that by the time the trial took place, solidarity with them conflicted with the solidarity I owed to Damon and Minnie, friends who had taken so much time and trouble for me. The judge told me he hoped my research would contribute to the task of keeping those young vandals in line and stormed out of the courtroom. As soon as the judge left, I embraced Minnie warmly and thanked her. I told her I was able to pay all the lawyer's fees that were involved. Minnie said she'd feel terribly insulted to be paid by one of my best friends. I almost cried when she said that. The last time I had seen her, on the day when Hugh had carried me out of the garage, I hadn't treated her as one of my best friends. I had angrily asked Minnie and Damon, what are you two staring at? I asked her how she had become a radical lawyer, and she asked if that was something like being a radical general. Minnie smiled and told me she'd like to discuss that with you more than anyone I know, Sophie. But she said she had to run off to another case and promised to visit me. I gave her my address and phone number. Damon waited for me outside the courtroom. Well, at least that's over and done with, he said. I told Sabina you probably wouldn't be released until this afternoon. I asked him, how often can you be beaten before you cry out with pain, Damon? You don't look well at all, Sophie, he told me. The last time I saw you, I was certain you'd hate me for the rest of my life, Damon. I don't claim to understand you, Sophie, but I have no reason to hate you. He again expressed concern for my health and acted as if he'd forgotten about the scene I made with Pat and Louisa. The amazing thing is that he probably has. Twelve years ago, when Minnie had slapped his face after the formation of the omission staff, he had walked away, and a few days later, he had simply driven to Minnie's house to pick her up to attend the newspaper's production meeting, as if nothing had happened. He seems to take nothing personally. Two years ago, he helped me get my first teaching job. When I was fired, I showered him with insults. Yet when he heard of another opening, he called me again. And three weeks ago, at Louisa's, he ran away from what must have seemed to him like a psychopath and a nymphomaniac. Yet here he was again, helping to get me out of jail. He'll probably call me in a few days to tell me about another teaching job. In some ways, he's insupportable. In other ways, he's the nicest person I know. I told him, I don't understand you either, Damon, and I don't hate you. I kissed his lips gently as soon as we were in the car. Since Sabina wasn't expecting us before noon, I asked if he'd mind giving me a ride across the border to see if another letter from you had come to my box. Your newest letter was there. 
I canceled the post box. I won't be needing it anymore. I tore the envelope open right there and started reading, but I got no further than the middle of the first paragraph. More is breaking down and more is rising up than I'm able to take in. The tears that filled my eyes kept me from seeing the following sentence. On the way home, I asked Damon how Louisa had been arrested. I had already learned some of the things he told me. The picket line at Louisa's plant had become a battleground for various ideological groups. No, the competition between the groups wasn't set off by Damon's modest leaflet. Members of three or four political groups had created radical caucuses in the plant's union organization, and each group had come to the picket line to support the program of its caucus. The official union apparatus publicly labeled all these politicians outside agitators, and union goons tried to remove them from the picket line. At that point, the picket line became a battleground between entrenched and inspiring union functionaries. The political groups summoned their followers to the picket line to struggle for the rights of radical politicians to join picket lines and peddle their programs without being stigmatized and abused. Of course, Louisa was on that picket line from morning to night. She had been waiting for something like that to happen. She had hoped Pat and the people from the council office would set it off. The political groups won. Their members and sympathizers far outnumbered the union functionaries. At that point, the union bureaucrats withdrew from the picket line, and the central union apparatus started circulating the rumor that professional saboteurs had taken over the plant. Buses loaded with armed police, as well as an army unit with machine guns and a tank, attacked the assembly plant. All the picketers, Louisa among them, were arrested. They were taken to a high school gymnasium, where they were supposedly going to be processed. The agitators were going to be separated from the people who actually worked in the plant, and therefore had a legal right to be on the picket line. The identification cards of all the workers were taken, and they weren't returned, nor were the workers released. At that point, all the people at the gymnasium were carted off to jail. The workers could no longer prove they worked at the plant. That was the union's way of punishing workers who had stood by the agitators. Damon told me he would have been arrested too if he weren't in the habit of getting up at noon. By the time he reached the plant, it was already occupied by the police and surrounded by soldiers. He went directly to the jail where the arrested picketers had supposedly been taken, and arrived there before they did. He called the Radical Lawyers Collective, and many succeeded in getting Louisa released the very next day, at which time Louisa told them she had seen me in jail. I asked him if the people who couldn't prove they worked in the plant, namely the outside agitators, were left in jail. What were we to do, he asked me, leave Louisa in jail? A civil rights lawyer interceded for the workers whose cards had been taken away, and each political group engaged its own lawyer to release its own militants. When we reached my house, I tried awkwardly to ask Damon to forgive me for having been so mean to him, but he really did act as if he'd forgotten about it, so I didn't try very hard. I asked if he wanted to come in, but he didn't. Sabina heard me close his car door and came out of the house shouting after his car, Hey, Professor, thank you. She pulled me inside the house and hugged me tightly. I felt like the last survivor, she told me. Ted and Tina disappeared. Tissy is gone. You didn't come back. My whole universe vanished. Then she looked at my bruised face and shouted, What did those bastards do to you? Disregarding her concern for my injuries, I asked her, How did it all end, Sabina? Why? I've been waiting for you to tell me that. You're the sociologist of revolution, not I. Look, she said, pointing to the walls. I've thoughtfully decorated the house with research documents, so that you can tell me how and why. Are you well enough to look at them? I'm well enough, Sabina, but help me. I don't think I can stand to look at them by myself. Sabina escorted me to her exhibits. I read until I collapsed in her arms, completely nauseated. She had decorated our walls with articles, headlines, pictures. All of them told, in a distorted, intimidating manner, the story of the death of the hopes of thousands of people. One after another story described in detail the raises the union had won for the workers, after which the workers had victoriously returned to work. Other stories described all sorts of vandals and outside agitators ousted from factories by union officials assisted by law enforcement agencies. I paused at an article which was headed, Liberation of the University. My head swam as I read it. Several paragraphs described guerrillas and terrorists who had forcibly established fighting bases in all of the university buildings. The article went on to say that real students called the police to protect them from terrorists who were beating and threatening them. The article didn't ex explain what the real students were doing there. Presumably they were trying to attend their classes. The university administration then demanded forceful and decisive action to put an end to the anarchy and terrorism, at which point the police could no longer simply stand by while the lives of students are being threatened. The concluding paragraph said the students did not receive orders to intervene until responsible student groups within the university itself called for the liberation of the university from the vandals, guerrillas, and terrorists. 
It was after reading this that I collapsed. I couldn't read any more. I told Sabina what had happened at Luis's plant and asked if the defeat had been similar everywhere. Pointing to other clippings, she told me, the pattern was similar at the research center and in several other plants, but the police only attacked places where the union's authority was challenged, which was the case at Luis's plant and at the research center, or where there was no union, as in the university. In more than half the plants, the police didn't have to intervene. The union herded workers back to their posts much more effectively and with much less friction than the police could possibly have done. When you feel better, study some of the pictures, the ones of workers returning to their jobs after their victories, smiling and waving their arms. Sabina pulled me to the kitchen. She had prepared a rice casserole for my homecoming. On the table, there was a bottle of wine as well as a bottle of champagne. I cried from gratitude and told her, at least we still have each other. I asked if she was willing to tell me how she had gotten separated from Tissy. Two or three days after you left, one of the women in the group I was working with discovered a miscalculation. I and several others threw ourselves into the problem. I was sure the vehicle would run if we solved that problem. Tissy wasn't with me. She was upset that neither Ted nor you had returned, and she wandered around the center thinking she'd run into one of you. She even waited for both of you at the gate. She wasn't able to interpret what she saw there, so she came to tell me about it. People who seemed to be workers were stopping cars at the gate and asking their drivers for documents. She was extremely nervous about it and begged me to abandon the center. Let's go elsewhere, she begged. Let's go far away from the city, near a pond. Let's first find Ted and Sophia and Tina. I was angry. She had dreamt of an island empire before in the garage. I wrongly thought she was reviving that suggestion. I told her not to worry about the new guards at the gate, because they were probably people who had always wanted to be cops and had never before had a chance. And I told her not to worry about you or Ted or Tina. If the whole world was opening up, you were all having the time of your lives elsewhere. I returned to the transportation problem. By the time I realized Tissy had been right about the change of climate, it was too late. A fight broke out in one of the laboratories. A self-constituted research workers' council of four vigilantes confronted the lab workers because they were harboring two outsiders. The whole group stood by the outsiders, just as my group would have stood by Tissy and me. But the vigilantes started pulling the outsiders out by force. Several lab workers tried to stop them, and some instruments were damaged. At that point, the union spread the rumor that vandals were destroying the equipment and that a worker had been killed. The people guarding the gate, I later learned, were union goons. They let in several cops to investigate the supposed sabotage and killing. The vigilantes of the council immediately showed them the equipment damage in the fight they had themselves provoked. Union loudspeakers announced that the investigators had found wanton wreckage of equipment and that the body of the murdered man had disappeared. I looked frantically for Tissy but couldn't find her. The police got the order to clear the vandals out of the center, which obviously meant everyone since they couldn't tell them from looks. Swinging their clubs and pointing their rifles at us, they herded us out as if we were cattle. Those who didn't have cars were forced into buses until the whole area was clean. The center was surrounded by police as well as soldiers, and they all looked ready to shoot at the slightest provocation. All that mattered was the precious equipment. The people were replaceable. I came home and sat by the telephone, but not a single one of you called. This house was like a prison. Two days after our eviction from the center, I took a taxi to Ted's print shop and saw police outside and inside it. I went to the research center. There was obviously no sign of Tissy. What I saw was caravans of police cars, busloads of National Guard, and police barricades that kept the taxi from getting closer than a block away from the gate. And even at that distance, I was ordered not to get out of the taxi. I saw a large red banner above the gate but couldn't read what it said. I asked the cop who had ordered me not to leave my seat. It says, United we stand, divided we fall, he told me. I shouted, the police and the union, how appropriate. I rode back to my prison. Something inside me started to boil. I knew I had made a horrible mistake by throwing myself into that vehicle research. That mistake is 32 years old. Don't, Sabina, please. I haven't seen you cry since Jose died. I can't take it, not now, not yet. I won't be able to swallow your wonderful meal. You're right, Sophia. We do still have each other. I went wild with joy last week when Damon called. At least you had been found. And Ted called on the following day. He told me he had tried to return to the research center two days after he had left you with your friend Pat. He had stayed an extra day thinking you might want to go back with him. But Pat returned to the print shop by himself. He told Tina and Ted about some trouble starting in the university. Pat and Tina printed a leaflet and ran off with it. Ted didn't know what happened to them after that. So Ted headed back to the center by himself. I wanted to go back with him, Sabina. But you were busy evaluating who you really were and what you really wanted. That's in fact exactly what I was doing, and I was running to Yarstan about it. Didn't Ted get back to the center? 
The self-appointed guard stopped him at the gate, and he didn't have an identification card, so they didn't let him in. He parked his car nearby, hoping he'd see someone he recognized who might let Tissy know what had happened to him. But the Union guards saw him and got suspicious. Two police cars drove up to him. They asked him to explain his presence there. He told them his friends were inside the plant. They asked him to name those friends, but he refused. They beat him and then arrested him. When I told him Tissy had disappeared, he said, It figures. I suppose it does. I know as well as Ted what she does whenever she's intensely disappointed and frustrated. Heroin? Yes, Sophia. And her disappointment and frustration began when I refused to leave with her. Like the police, like Albert's, I valued technology higher than Tissy's love. I interrupted her again. I was too weak to listen to Sabina's self-accusations on my first night home. I told her, I have a surprise for you. I gave her all three of your letters. She read all three of them that night. I didn't read your most recent letter until the next morning. I couldn't for the same reason that I couldn't bear to see Savina tear herself inside out. Not that night. Yaristan is right, was the first thing Sabina shouted to me the following day. We should have wrecked everything in that research center instead of just damaging a couple of instruments. None of that is for us, for our desires and capacities. Frustration and anger stayed with Sabina all week long. Your letters didn't set off her fury, but they did fan it. At the same time, they helped her focus on the contradiction in, at the heart of her life. What I tried to do to Tissy was exactly what Alberts and Louisa tried to do to Margarita, and what Louisa tried to do to Yarrowstown, she told me. Tissy wanted only to swim in a pond, to lie on the banks in the sun, to walk through a forest. But I didn't want to. I wanted to eliminate ponds and forests. I wanted to replace them with something I'd help create. I wanted an immense crystal palace with artificial suns, artificial ponds, artificial forests, all products of science and of technology. You did have reservations when I talked to you at the research center, I reminded her. It's easy to have reservations, Sophia. I didn't act on them, and that's all that counts. I remained Sabina Alberts to the very end. I have lied to myself all my life. I always thought I had created such a perfect synthesis between Margarita Nachalo's and George Alberts' commitments. I was wrong. What confused me was that Alberts had also be been a rebel once. His rebellion was the diametrical opposite of Margarita's. She rebelled against the constraints imposed by social institutions. Alberts rebelled against nature. It wasn't when he became reactionary that he negated Margarita's rebellion. It was his rebellion itself that negated Margarita. He gave himself completely to science and technology. His rebellion was the rebellion of the brain against the rest of the natural environment. He was committed to destroy everything that wasn't science and technology, to destroy the very environment in which human life can take place. Whatever wasn't the brain's creation had to be destroyed. Everything we call nature, the human being included. It's a horrible obsession. A puny part of nature, the brain, suddenly started destroying everything else, consuming the conditions for its own health and survival. It's as if mosquitoes started to consume the rest of nature, as if water attacked all the other elements and transformed them into water, as if fire suddenly attacked and consumed everything that wasn't burning. Albert's inverted Margarita's rebellion. She affirmed life, first of all her own life, she rebelled against everything that constrained the living. Alberts affirmed technology. He rebelled against everything that constrained the further development of productive forces. That's why he ended up considering human beings reactionary. Human beings constrain the development of productive forces. Human beings have to be overcome. The beings who would inhabit the Crystal Palace wouldn't be human beings. They'd have to be progressive beings, beings which, like the suns and the ponds, were products of science and technology. Alberts tried to channel Margarita into a rebellion against herself. He failed with Margarita. She died fighting her own struggle. It was me that he succeeded in channeling. And all the time I thought I was channeling myself, I thought he was helping me realize my own desires, which I thought identical to Margarita's desires. Before we emigrated, I made him promise to build me a lab. He kept his promise. He built the lab. He let me pull out of him everything he knew, chemistry, physics, engineering, he brought all kinds of books home, textbooks, theoretical works. He satisfied every desire he had himself created in me. Something crucial was still missing. I missed Jan Sedlak, the playful, independent peasant with whom I had spent the two wonderful weeks before we emigrated. And I missed his sister. I dreamed about the forbidden night we'd spent in each other's arms. The first gap was filled when you brought Ron Matthews home. You were drawn to him like a magnet, Sabina. I thought the two of you were in love the moment you saw each other. I knew you, I knew you thought that and I resented your jealousy. Ron was just like Jan. After he'd stayed in your room for a week, the three of us rode to a forest. That night, I tried to pretend you were a little bit like his sister, but you were like a cube of ice. A few days later, Ron came for us with his father's car. 
I hungered for adventure. I didn't know you, Sophia, any better than you knew me. You were mean, suspicious, and freezing cold. I thought you and Ron had fucked in the water or on the beach, and I hated you for thinking that. I purposely made no effort to deny it. Is that why you called me a coward, just like my mother? I thought you were trying to do to Ron what, what Louisa had done to Nachalo and Margarita. Pick them up in the street and shape them into becoming cannon fodder for her organization. I was wrong about you, Sophia, and I'm sorry I said that. I wasn't wrong only about you. I was wrong about myself. I was wrong about Albert's. At the time, I still thought Albert's, Nachalo, and Margarita stood for the same things. I thought Albert's would recognize Ron as another Margarita. All my bubbles burst when Albert's and I moved into our house and Ron moved in with us. Albert's couldn't stand Ron. He called Ron a hoodlum, an adventurist, a petty criminal. He called Ron exactly the same names with which he described the reactionaries who had fought against his popular army. That was when I started to suspect Albert's hadn't fought alongside people like Ron, people like Nachalo and Margarita, but against them. My suspicions were all confirmed when I learned the role Albert's played in having Debbie Matthews fired from the high school. Ron was furious. He wanted to destroy Albert's house, but I was too attached to my lab. Ron responded exactly as Jan would have, destroy the technology. For my sake, he compromised. We decided to incapacitate the brand new projector the school had just acquired. It was a perfect theft. Nothing was ever proved. That bastard father of his got Ron jailed because he was a hoodlum and Debbie Matthews' son, not because they proved he had stolen the lens. He was sent to reform school and I was left alone with Alberts. I had to get out of there. I knew then that Alberts hadn't been Margarita's ally. He wasn't even Luisa's. He was as vicious a reactionary as Tom Matthews. I had met Jose at Ron's trial. He hated Matthews even more than I hated Alberts. He and Ron were almost brothers, you know, like you and I. I asked Sabina to tell me about the time when Ron and Jose had been almost brothers. They weren't really like you and me, Sophia. They weren't as different from each other. Jose had been adopted by the Matthews during the Depression. His father was unknown, and his mother had died giving birth to him. Tom and Debbie both had jobs. They were also political militants. When Ron was born, neither of them had time to bring him up. Jose was Ron's nurse, teacher, mother, and father. He taught Ron everything, including stealing. Once, sometime after the war, the police came to their house and investigated the stolen bikes they kept in the basement. Jose acted very professional and told them he and Ron repaired bikes. Then he challenged the cops to prove the bikes in the basement were stolen. The first thing he always did was to change the color and registration number and to switch parts around different bikes. The police left, but by then Tom Matthews was no longer a political militant. During the war, he had become a staunch law and order man. He started to dream about buying his own store. He chased Jose out of the house and accused him of having turned Ron into a punk. Jose hated him after that. He got a factory job in a room. Suddenly he got drafted. He was sure Tom Matthews had called the draft board. Jose quit his job, left his room, and went into hiding. He looked up Seth, who was wealthy by then because he'd gotten into dealing heroin. Jose and Ron had stolen bikes with Seth. Jose dropped the name Matthews and became Cicero. Seth gave him a job, not selling heroin, but making contacts. Jose had just started working for Seth when Debbie Matthews re reached him and told him about Ron's trial. I was really impressed when I met Jose. Nothing appealed to me more than the idea of joining the hoodlums and adventurers Alberts despised. I saw Jose regularly. We talked about getting a project off the ground as soon as Ron was released. I couldn't wait. Ron took me to Ted's garage the day he was released. I knew then that I had found everything I'd ever looked for. Ron and Jose were like Jan Sedlek's brothers. Ted provided the technology. Kissy was a perfect Myrna and Margarita. I thought everything would be perfect if I could only keep them all together. But that wasn't going to be easy. First of all, Ted was hostile to me from the very first moment we met. Secondly, Ron pined for you. He lost interest in everything else, and you were beyond anyone's reach by then. I couldn't hang on to him. I became desperate. I didn't want to lose anyone else. Seth had money. The only way to combine Jose with Ted and Tissy was for all of us to buy the garage with Seth's money. To Ted, that was heroin money. But not to Jose, I asked. Jose worked for Seth, but didn't get directly involved in the heroin. He thought none of the rest of us would get involved either. Don't forget Jose didn't have that many alternatives. After being chased out by Matthews, he'd gotten a factory job, and every time he'd see Ron, he told him, What a grind it is. There must be other ways to stay alive. Don't you remember how passionately Ron hated the very idea of getting a job? And then that draft call made Jose furious. Those bastards don't just want you to slave for them. They want you to die for them, too, he told me. That was why he'd looked up Seth, and he'd been very impressed with the way Seth had made it without letting himself be put through the grinder. 
At that time, he didn't care a whole lot just how Seth had made it, and neither did I. If everything was allowed and nothing was banned, then Seth could make it any way he pleased. But Ted didn't go along with any of that. He didn't say a whole lot that first night, but I could read on his face that he didn't like what Jose and I were telling him. What intrigued him was mastery over things, and he thought already then that heroin meant mastery over people. He made it a point of stealing only rich people's cars because he thought everyone ought to have access to what he or she needed, and stealing from the poor deprived them of their access. He and Ron had shared that attitude. That was what had drawn them to each other in reform school. I understood Ted's objections, but I dismissed them. I thought he was too limited. His attitudes conflicted with nothing is banned. I told him he was 100% right, and then I presented to do to him what Luisa had done to Nachala and Margarita. I dragged him into a project that negated his own. I was set on combining George Alberts with Jan Sedlock. Ted and Jose were perfect for that combination. I'd rejected Alberts the man, but not his worldview. I tried to convince Ted by telling him others didn't treat him the way he treated them. He was Tissy's brother and guardian. He stole only from the rich. He thought he sold the cars to others like himself, to people who needed the cars to make life possible for other Teds and other Tissies. I told him he was blind. The people he sold the cars to resold them for a huge profit, and they exploited him as well as those they sold them to. They were no different from the garage owner to whom he paid enormous rents. Ted gave in, not because I convinced him, but because I saw through him. We bought the garage with Seth's money and transformed it into the technological playland I had wanted. Ted was simultaneously attracted and repelled by me. He loved to show me how to steal cars, and I quickly became almost as good as he was. I, in turn, demonstrated to him the theoretical principles behind the mechanical operations he had learned from practice. He was grateful beyond words, but everything else about me repelled him. He was afraid of my philosophizing. It was all lies to Ted, lies with which I had covered up the fact that heroin destroyed the lives of people like ourselves. He thought me a hypocrite. I had often repeated that any of us could leave at any time and start again elsewhere. But Ted didn't want to leave Jose or me or Tizzy or the garage. He just wanted to exclude Seth and the heroine from the garage. Telling him, you can leave at any time, was equivalent to telling him, thanks for Tizzy in the garage, Ted. See you around. And Ted knew that if we failed to distinguish people from things outside the garage, we'd soon fail to distinguish them inside as well. If we turned strangers into instruments, we'd soon turn each other and even ourselves into instruments. And he was right. It was Tissy who became the first instrument, though not right away. It all took place in small, gradual steps, so gradual that I failed to notice them until they had all been taken. We were all full of enthusiasm when we fixed up the house behind the garage. I knew Tissy wanted me as much as I wanted her. We had known this since the night of Ron's release. But when the house was done, Jose and I each moved into separate rooms. Tissy moved in with Ted, Vic with Seth. Where was Tina at that time, I asked. I had left her with Albert's. He hired a nurse to take care of her. Tissy wanted to move into my room, but I didn't want her to. I thought that would drive a final wedge between Ted and me. I didn't know Ted had long been familiar with the nature of Tissy's passion. I exerted myself to stay away from someone I loved. That was a very bad mistake. Tissy was frustrated and felt rejected. She fixed up another room and moved into it by herself. And then she started taking heroin shots from Seth. She did that only to spite me, as well as Ted. She convinced herself Ted was responsible for my unwillingness to let her move in with me. It all became extremely complex when Jose started courting me. I assured him I had never been Ron's girl or any man's, but he wouldn't believe me. It was only then that I asked Tissy to move in with me, but it was already too late. I did get Jose to accept me as I was. A warm, mutual friendship replaced his initial unbelieving shock. But I couldn't get Tissy to drop the heroin. She had been so pretty. She became sickly and mean. She started to blackmail me with the heroin. Tizzy blackmailed you? Yes, Sophia. All of Ted's initial fears started to be realized. We were turning each other into instruments. Debbie Matthews visited the garage and told us Ron had been killed. Debbie blamed me for his death, and in her drunken state she considered Alberts responsible for it. So did I. To me, Alberts symbolized the entire reactionary apparatus he had decided to serve when he had Debbie fired from the school. I rushed to Alberts' house and kidnapped Tina when the nurse went shopping. I left him a note telling him I'd become a dope pusher and could therefore take better care of Tina than he could. And before I left, I destroyed the upstairs lab. Tina was four and I couldn't stand her. She was so dumb. I only took her to spite Alberts. Jose felt the same way about her as I did, but both Ted and Tissy loved her as soon as they set eyes on her, and each wanted to keep the other away from her. Ted thought that in her condition, Tissy would harm the child, and Tissy's resentment of Ted grew into passionate hatred. She started considering him her jailer. And that was when she started blackmailing me. 
She talked about moving to a deserted island with no one on it but Tissy, Tina, and me. Gradually, the island became the garage itself. She told me she wouldn't stop taking heroin unless I got rid of all the men. If I didn't get rid of them, then I was the one responsible for her taking heroin. I was the one who made her Seth's slave because I kept her chained to Seth. I thought Tissy was hallucinating, both about the island and about my responsibility for her condition. I didn't want to believe a single word of her accusation. I had her move back into her own room. I wanted to be on my own. A few weeks later, Ted told me he had decided to leave the garage. He didn't tell me his reasons. I knew them. I also knew he held me responsible for everything, just as Tissy did. Ted also thought Tissy's heroin addiction was a direct result of Seth's presence, and I was the one who had brought Seth as well as Jose to the garage. Ted had probably been convinced all along that we could have bought the garage and the building without Seth's money. I had doubted it. The sum had seemed impossibly large to me, and I had been in a tremendous rush to get out of Albert's house. In other words, both Ted and Tissy were right. I was the one responsible for forcing Seth and Vic on them. Ted also blamed me for the impoverishment of the activity itself. When I first moved in, he and I had stolen cars, transformed them, repaired them. But gradually, the garage became a fence, a depot for cars that younger kids stole. All we did was pay the kids and transform the stolen cars. We were something like bosses to them, what Ted's boss had once been to him. And of course, what Ted liked least of all was the fact that the garage served mainly as a front for Seth's heroin, that Ted's own activities served to cover up something he hated. I remember he hated the garage when I was there. It was Ted who turned Alec against all of you. Why didn't Ted leave? Because of Tina? Don't keep reducing him to that, Sophia. Ted didn't leave because of all of us. Believe it or not, he also loved me and Tissy and Jose. All he ever wanted was the exclusion of Seth and Vic. But there was no way to get rid of Seth. He was the owner, and he acted more like an owner every day. If Ted had merely hated the garage, he would have left. But his attitude was ambiguous, like his attitude to me. He was simultaneously repelled and attracted, and the things that attracted him went together with those that repelled him. They weren't really so separable. When Ted told me he wanted to leave, I already knew Seth was going to buy the bar. And although the bar added yet more things that repelled Ted, it also added several that attracted him enough to convince him to stay. I saw the bar as an adventure, as an enrichment of our activity. It was, in fact, Tissy who made me look forward to it. As soon as Seth had told her about the bar, she had boasted to me that she wouldn't need me or Ted anymore. I'll be every bit as independent as my goddess Sabina, she told me. I'll be a high-class prostitute. I'll be able to buy my own deserted island. I have to admit I, too, look forward to that activity. Margarita had been a prostitute. I didn't want to exclude that from my life. And at that point, Ted's prediction was fulfilled. After turning each other into instruments, we turned ourselves, our own bodies, into instruments. Tissy and I both became high-class prostitutes. Jose made the arrangements. You mean Jose was a pimp? That's what Alec excused him of being. No, Sophia, those weren't the arrangements he made. There were no pimps, or if you prefer, each of us did her own pimping. Jose related to the bar, as he'd related to Seth's heroin. He made contacts, paid off certain people, threatened others. He had nothing to do with the prostitutes or the customers. The fact is that he disliked the bar as much as Ted did. Or I, for that matter. I could have killed some of those important bastards. Then why in the world did any of you stay with it? I tried to tell you then, Sophia. We didn't create the circumstances. We found ourselves in them and tried to change them. At least I thought we were changing them. It wasn't the prostitution that drew me to the bar. After the first night, I hated that. It was what the bar made possible that drew me there. Do you know how much money we took in every night? Everything that was taken in was split equally among us. Seth got ten times his share because a lot of the women, including Tissy, as well as many of the customers, were on heroin. Cynthia pays Seth most of what she got. But what I alone made paid for the house, the garage, the workshop in the basement, both art studios, my lab, and all the materials and machines we could dream of wanting. But then it was just a business. I didn't want to think that, Sophia. I still don't. Ted didn't like where the money came from, but for a while he acted as if he didn't know. Once the bar started going, he no longer needed to be a boss. He helped the kids set up their own garages, and he only worked on the really difficult jobs. He spent the rest of his time in the workshop or upstairs painting. No one could ever have dreamed what a creative person that car thief would turn out to be. And Tina became a wonder. She took to everything he taught her. She was a painter and a machinist at six. Ted and Tina weren't the only ones either. I wish I'd showed you the workshops and studios and apartments set up by some of the women. I don't think it was just a business, Sophia. Most of those women were like Ted and Tissy. They'd come right off the street. If it hadn't been for the bar, they'd have been turned into garbage. And there was no reason the thing couldn't spread. 
At least I didn't think there was. It was for Seth that the whole thing was just a business. The more money he took in, the more of a capitalist he became, and the greedier he got. He couldn't stand Ted because none of Ted's activity contributed anything to Seth. He saw all of Jose's and my money and some of Tissy's go into the house in the garage, and he didn't like it. He thought all of it went to support Ted and Tina and their projects, projects which in his eyes didn't produce anything. So he tried to force Tissy to get me hooked on heroin. When that didn't work, he tried to get Tissy to take Tina to the bar. Ted stopped Tissy, and when you came, he thought Seth had recruited you as well. That's what Tissy told me at the research center. But couldn't you have told Ted how wrong he was about me? That would have cleared up so many misunderstandings. If I had only known Sophia, I didn't learn to think about that until Ted told me the details several years later. I was in euphoria when you came to the garage. Everything seemed to be working perfectly. I had no idea what was boiling underneath. I loved you for coming exactly when you did. I was at the peak of my life's accomplishments. During the months before you came, my new friends had introduced me to experiences I had never before imagined. The bar gave me insights into the power structure of the entire city, insights which I thought I'd use against that power structure someday. The house and the garage had just been transformed into a technological utopia. I was completely independent, and I was surrounded by people who resembled Jan as well as Myrna, as well as the best side of Albert's. You couldn't have come at a better time. I thought that in a few months' contact with us would transform you. Into what, Sabina? I thought you'd become a little like you are now, reserved and introspective, but warm and interested and lively. And I disappointed you? No, you didn't. You became Jose's best friend. You seemed to enjoy your work with Tina so much. I was sure we'd gradually become good friends. You seemed irrationally afraid of Ted, but I was sure that would pass. I was totally blind to all the problems you experienced. I knew that Tizzy was wildly jealous of you, but I knew that only because I fanned her jealousy. I tried to blackmail her the way she'd blackmailed me. I told her I'd replace her with you and wouldn't take her back until she dropped the heroin. That was another mistake. Tizzy tried to get back at me by taking you from me. It was only in the research center I learned about that night, Sophia. I suppose it's ridiculous to apologize now. Weren't you even slightly angry at me for not having known or even suspected anything until then? For being so naive, so stupid? Sabina laughed and threw her arms around me. On the contrary, I loved you for that. It was so characteristic of you. I was embarrassed by myself, but I couldn't help laughing with her. Our conversation took place about two days after she read your letters. It rained all day long, and it felt wonderful to spend the entire day indoors with Sabina, listening to stories that helped me forget everything that had happened the previous week. After supper that night, there was a violent thunderstorm. We turned out the lights and spent about an hour looking out the window at a frightening display of lightning. When the thunderstorm moved away, I reminded her that during all these years, I had never learned why she and Tina had finally left the garage. I think the presence of your friends in the garage made Seth hysterical. After Alec moved in, Seth threatened me. If you don't get him out of there, I'll close up the garage and Ted and Alec Sophia go out on the street. I obviously told him to go to hell. He didn't pay the bills at the garage. He no longer lived at the house. But the fact is that he did own it. What I didn't know was that he actually became paranoid. On the day when your other friends came, Seth thought you and Ted had hatched a plan to get rid of Seth and Vic, though I still can't imagine how he thought you'd do that. And on that day, I made yet another mistake. I thought Seth was offended by your friends for the same reason I was, because they had come to judge and to condemn activity which was organized by those with least access to self-organized activity. They had no right to judge us. I was actually glad when Seth pulled his gun on them, and I gagged with frustration when he took their side and left with them. After your friends left, Jose convinced himself all of us were becoming Seth's employees, his tools, as Tissy had already become. He as well as Ted tried to tell me that, but I wouldn't listen to Jose any more than I had ever listened to Ted. I was completely blind. I told Jose he was dead wrong. I talked about expanding the activity yet further, about helping set up bars and workshops elsewhere. I imagined that the Crystal Palace I had dreamed of was about to be built from the ground up by the people themselves, the lowest layers among them. Jose grew increasingly frustrated by his inability to communicate with me. We never learned why he got arrested, but I suppose he got careless with one of his contacts. It was only after Jose's arrest that I started to become aware of my mistake. Soon after the arrest, Tissy confronted me with the proposition that it first seemed like another one of her attempts to blackmail me. Get rid of the men, she told me again. Take over the bar, and I'll stop taking heroin and stick by you. We'll make it our empire. If you don't, Ted goes out on the street, the house and garage get closed down, and Tina comes to the bar. It seemed like the same proposition Tissy had made earlier, except that I recognized Seth's threat behind Tissy's. And at that point, I knew Jose had been right, and Ted had been right since the beginning. 
Seth had put, pulled his gun on your friends. I knew he'd pull it on Ted as well, and on me if necessary. Seth somehow convinced himself I actually wanted to turn the bar into tissies in my empire, and my eviction was very simple. With his gun pointing, he told me, clear out and take the kid with you. Yet Ted stayed on until Jose's release. He couldn't abandon Tissy to Seth, and he even agreed to do some of Jose's contact work as a condition for his staying. If Ted had left too, the bar would have closed down when I left. The following day was clear and sunny. After lunch, Sabina and I went for a walk to the riverbank near our house. As we sat and watched the boats pass by us, Sabina drew conclusions from all she had told me about her experiences in the garage, experiences which were so completely different from mine. I tried to combine elements that couldn't be combined. Yaristan sees a contradiction between my commitments. I'm only starting to see that contradiction now. By the time I left the garage, I knew we had all become tools. Not only Seth's tools, we had also become tools to each other and to ourselves. In Seth's view, we were nothing but costs in a capitalist enterprise. It's not the contradiction between Seth and the rest of us that's becoming clear to me now. That was clear to me by the time I left the garage. What I'm starting to see now is that the two parts of my own project were contradictory. I wanted to rebuild George Albert's Crystal Palace with people like Margarita, people like Jan and Myrna and Yara. But that wasn't possible, Sophia. I didn't understand that until now. In order to do that, I had to destroy them. None of them, not Ron or Jose or Tissy or even Ted, could carry Albert's project as their own. Ted was the only one who even came close to having some of Albert's interests. But Ted never had a mania to destroy the environment. All he wanted to do was decorate it. I tried to be a bridge between land and water. I don't like to admit this to you, but I now see that my project had a lot in common with Louisa's. I don't see that, Sabina. Louisa told me Alberts came to them and offered them his services. Apparently he knew how to make bombs. And she didn't even know Titus Abram then. You're right, Sophia. I'm thinking out loud. I'm not referring to actual situations, but to symbols. The question I'm asking is, who stole whose soul, and for whom? I know Alberts went to them. I also know he initially went to them in order to serve their project, not his own. But the initial affirmation of their project turned into a negation of their project, gradually, step by step. So gradually one couldn't see what was happening, as in the garage. Louisa got Nachalo into the Union, but she didn't thereby transform Nachalo. She transformed the Union instead. Nachalo and Margarita caused a split in the Union local. Instead of bending to the apparatus, they made it bend. They formed something like a terrorist gang inside the Union. Their goal remained what it had been before, to remove the obstacles to human life, to destroy everything that turned people into tools. You're right. Alberts introduced his knowledge into their framework. His explosives were to be used against the obstacles to their development. But this was the extent to which they were interested in his technology. Alberts was able to tell me that Margarita dreamed of industrializing the world from the ground up only because she died. Don't you see that? For Alberts, the production of the explosive was to be the first step. For Margarita, it would have been the last. For Alberts, that production was itself the goal. For Margarita, it was nothing but a means. If Margarita was anything at all like Tissy or Myrna, and that's how I now visualize her, then she didn't dream of going on from the production of explosives to the production of artificial ponds, artificial sunshine, and supersonic vehicles. Alberts read this into her, and he made me read it into her, because she seemed to have died for that, but only in his eyes. Alberts couldn't understand why else she'd have fought on the barricades, and neither could I. Now I'm starting to understand why. Myrna and Yara helped me understand. Yaristan told us why else Margarita would have fought, to clear away the obstacles to their enjoyment, not to clear away fetters in the development of productive forces. It was that popular army Alberts joined that fought to remove the fetters to the construction of his crystal palace, and Margarita as well as Nachula were among those fetters. That was the struggle Louisa tried to channel them into. She and Alberts were able to present them as forerunners of that struggle only because they were dead. Louisa tried to turn them into agents of their own repression and failed. They both had to die before they could become that. Only their corpses could have been made to serve that struggle. She stole their souls and gave them to Alberts and Zabrin. How else would you put it? She told you, Zabrin, and Alberts fought alongside Nachalo. Only Nachalo's corpse fought along Zabrin and Alberts. Only Margarita's corpse fought Alberts' revolution. Yaristan speculates that Zabrin couldn't have fought in the popular army. Yaristan is very lucid about some things. He's wrong about Zabrin. The very first time Alberts told me about those events, he described his recruitment into the popular army by none other than Titus Zabrin who was indeed in uniform at the time, the popular army's uniform. Zabrin was one of the first recruits of that organization. Zabrin and Albert served in the same unit, on the same front. They experienced the same defeat. They retreated together. They were demobilized at the same time. 
Yaristan is right about the ambiguity of Luis's claim that Titus and George joined Nachalo at the front. He's right because they couldn't possibly have joined Nachalo. I too would like to know what Alberts told Luisa when he returned from the front completely transformed. What surprises me in Luisa's claim isn't that Zabrin fought alongside Alberts, but that the two joined Nachalo. I didn't know anything about the militia until Yaristan told us what he'd learned from Manuel. I thought what Luisa still thinks, that all of them fought the same struggle. That's why I was able to synthesize Nachalo with Alberts, but that unity didn't exist at its very origin. When Nachalo left for the front a few days after the barricades, there was no popular army. Nachalo joined a militia unit like the one Manuel described. He might even have been Manuel's own unit. Alberts and Zabrin joined Nachalo the same way they joined Manuel, as mortal enemies. We sat on a bench by the river until dark. On several earlier occasions, Sabina had told me fragments of what she'd learned from Alberts about that revolution. I had always felt somewhat proud of the fact that my life was in some way connected with those events. But as I listened to her a few days ago, I didn't feel proud. I felt uneasy, almost ashamed. During my entire life, I had identified with everything Louisa had praised. Suddenly you and then Sabina started to undermine it all. I'm only now starting to understand the reappraisal you carried out during your second prison term, when you re-examined everything you'd learned from Louisa in the light of what you'd learned from Manuel. I'm starting to understand the significance of the revolutionary tasks Louisa accomplished in the rear. She never hid the fact that the final aim of the efficient transportation, vehicle production, food distribution, was military, nor the fact that the production was war production, nor the fact that it was devoted to the popular army's military victory. Louisa gathered Nachalo and Margarita off the street and gave them to Alberts and Zabrin. That's such a strange way to put it, but I couldn't tell Sabina I didn't know what she meant. I learned only recently that Louisa never really imagined daily activity as other than what it is, as joyless drudgery for the sake of an apparatus whose goals we don't understand, whose reasons aren't our reasons. To Louisa, that drudgery was meaningful. She even found joy in it, because she was always so sure that the people who directed the apparatus understood its goals and knew its reasons, people like Alberts and Zabrin and Damon Hesper. I can see why Louisa insists Alberts and Zabrin join Nachalo on the same front. It's because her front isn't the actual field or village where the battles took place. Louisa's front is the train Zenit described to you. It's the Union. She was the one who took Nachalo aboard that train. Everyone on that train was part of the same struggle. But the content of the struggle, the destination, wasn't defined by the people on the train. It was defined by the train's conductors, the professors devoted to our movement. The reason I feel uneasy, even ashamed, is that I can't convince myself I ever wanted to do anything other than board that train. Please give all my love to those comrades of yours who are intent on defining their own aims and on finding their own struggle. Your Sophia. P.S. Don't forget to address your next letter to my house, since the postal strike is over. I almost forgot to ask you something that's been bothering me. You told me Titus Zabrin was the first person who visited you after your arrest at the time of the Magarna Rising. I think it really strange that he didn't mention my letter to you, especially in view of the fact that Myrna already then considered my letter responsible for all those arrests. The other thing that bothers me is that Titus apparently wasn't arrested at that time. I gather that Myrna looked for him and found him shortly after the arrest took place, but I thought all the people I had written to had been arrested, including Titus.